It's that time of year again! With E3 less than a month away, I can practically smell the concentrated gamer energy permeating through the air. It's that one time of year where almost everyone I know is excited to watch commercials. So excited that if they don't see enough of the exact commercials that they wanted to see, they get mad. Because Nintendo continues to carry its brand on franchises that are multiple decades old, I feel like their expectations are some of the highest I've ever seen for a gaming company. It's Schrodinger's E3. You never know if you're gonna get this or this for any given announcement. Funnily enough, that 15-year-old meme is literally people reacting to Nintendo E3s. In that spirit, today I'm gonna talk about 10 Nintendo games that ended up disappointing me the most. Each of these games raised my hopes only to dash them for one reason or another. By remembering those dark times where games ended up letting me down the most, I found that I can keep my expectations in check a bit better each year. So let's check it. My personal, and this is important, it's my personal, Jay Witz's opinion, not universal objective truth, top 10 disappointing Nintendo games. These aren't necessarily in order of how good or bad I think these games are compared to each other, but instead in order of how much they crushed my soul. Number 10. One, two, Switch. I've said it before, but I really believe in the power of inclusive gaming. Ever since I was able to bowl with my freaking grandma in Wii Sports, it opened my eyes to the power of being able to play video games with people who don't normally play video games. The Wii was absolutely carried by the power of Wii Sports, and even Nintendo Land was an underrated but extremely fun kickoff for the Wii U. So when the Nintendo Switch launched, I had my fingers crossed for that new pack-in launch title to show us what the system's all about. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not a pack-in title with the Switch. It's one $50 bill. That changes things quite a bit! There's a very big difference between $50 bill and $0 bill. And honestly, this game is one of the worst values I can remember in recent history. It's a very small collection of minigames sent to bizarre, almost stock photo blandness. Some of the games are great, some of them are straight up broken, but despite a couple of fun nights, I haven't touched this game since 2017. The modes are sparse, and it has very little replay value. Thankfully, the Switch is full of great accessible party games. I'll play all of these over 1-2 Switch any day. Number 9. Luigi's Mansion. Oh no, I said it out loud. Oh no, my subs, my career, it's over. All right, before you close the video tab, let me at least explain myself on this one. Super Mario 64 is my favorite video game of all time. I got it with the launch of the N64, and I played it and replayed it and dug up every crazy glitch or secret that I could. I had that game from day one of the system, and it had me hooked for years. When I learned that Luigi would be leading the new Nintendo console into battle in some kind of Ghostbusters adventure game, I was pumped. I knew it wouldn't play the same as Mario 64, but I was hoping for another wonderful world to explore for years to come. Then I beat it on launch day. In like five or six hours, I felt like I had done everything there was to do in this game. I grabbed all the booze, I messed with New Game Plus, but in the end, I just realized I was done. Luigi's Mansion had excellent visuals and atmosphere, but in the end it just felt like a glorified tech demo for me. My own expectations for this game were just too high, and because of it, I took the L. Number 8 Chibi Robo Ziplash The original 2005-2006 Chibi Robo GameCube title is a brilliant gem. It's an insanely charming mix of a Toy Story-like world, adaptive sound effects, open exploration, and a heartfelt story. Oh my god, finally! Chibi Robo's headed back to consoles! This model looks way too good for the 3DS... Whoa. In the end, Ziplash was a functional but uninspired and repetitive platforming game. This is already a genre that Nintendo is stuffed full of, and it's just a bummer to see such an original concept repurposed for something so generic. The game's focus on real-life product placement for snack food also seems like a weird combination with a robot who wants to preserve the environment. I don't know. Ziplash isn't a terrible game, but it just isn't why we fell in love with this little guy over 10 years ago. Number 7 Star Fox Zero. The newest Star Fox title had some pretty impossible hype behind it. It was the first new Star Fox title in a decade. 
Unfortunately, Zero has this weird twofold problem. On one hand, the game just feels like a simple retread. It's basically a remake of Star Fox 64, which was already a remake of Star Fox, and has already had an enhanced remake on the 3DS. It's fun to revisit Corneria and the like, but I always personally enjoyed when Star Fox tried new enemies or characters with things like Star Fox Assault. And on the other hand, most of the game's new innovations just didn't land for me. The new vehicles and motion-powered two-screen control system just never felt intuitive for me, even rebooting the game to try it again just before this video. It's just baffling to me that I feel like I have more control over my R-Wing with a single analog stick in a 20-year-old game than with this new gimmick-powered system. I enjoyed the on-rails levels, but I found myself loathing almost everything else. I think what makes this hurt so much for me is that this game is the reason I was able to meet Shigeru Miyamoto in person and interview him. He has such a contagious enthusiasm for his games, but after playing the full release of the game about a month later, I just wasn't as enthusiastic. Number 6 Mario Party The Top 100 Mario Party has a very special place in my heart. Back in the day we had a Twitch show dedicated to it, we played every game all the time, even the weird stuff and the really weird stuff. So on paper, a game that combines minigame favorites from the first 10 main series games sounds incredible for a longtime Mario Party fan. And the 100 minigames they picked are fun, but you know what they're missing? Boards! Mario Party, for me, has always been a game about narratives. The minigames are the meat of the experience, but it's the shenanigans on the board that really give each game its story and soul. And soulless is a pretty perfect word that I've used to describe this game. When I think about my favorite Mario Party moments, it's things like stupid rolls, chance times, stolen stars, and epic comebacks. Mashing up Mario Party minigames is such a good idea on paper, but not delivering solid boards or a story mode to carry it? They dropped the ball on this one. Number 5 Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival the last pick didn't have enough boards, and now this game's problem is that it is a board. Amiibo Festival is cruel because it offers Animal Crossing fans a window into what could have been. It's a gorgeous HD look at classic villagers and silly life events, unfortunately packaged into a minigame collection that asks you to make additional purchases to get the most enjoyment out of it. It just feels exploitative, like something Tom Nook would do if he was a real person. The board game is extremely simple, it's almost not interactive, but I actually genuinely enjoyed the hex-based Desert Island Escape minigame. But ever since they added that minigame straight up into New Leaf, I felt like the only reason to own this game doesn't even exist anymore. The Wii U gamepad felt like a perfect place to manage inventory or write letters or draw patterns, but unfortunately, it just never came to be. Number 4 Red Steel when I first saw the Wii controller system, my mind immediately went to one place. Lightsabers! The concept of a motion-controlled sword just seemed like a match made in heaven. Ubisoft's Red Steel looked cool. It looked like the Wii's way of saying, yeah, we're gonna give you guys great motion-controlled action titles and your usual family-friendly stuff. Unfortunately, almost every element of Red Steel failed to live up to my lofty expectations. I immediately wanted dual analog sticks back. The turning is sluggish, the graphics were muddy, the voice acting was poor, the multiplayer was clunky, and the swords? The number one thing I was most excited about? They controlled about as well as if you tried to hold a sword with the toes of your foot. Red Steel really helped break the illusion for me fast. Motion controls still had a very long way to go. 2010's Red Steel 2 is actually pretty dang good with the Wii Motion Plus, and modern day VR has made my dream of using swords in a true one-to-one -one a reality. But back in 2006, it wasn't pretty. Number 3 Metroid Other M This baby's been done to death by pretty much any Metroid fan over the last decade, but man, this one still stings for me. The premise was exciting. They're gonna bring us a new, cinematic, modern Metroid that ties the story between Super and Fusion. It's led by the original creator of Metroid and the action programmings by Ninja Theory. It contains both 2D segments similar to classic Metroid and first-person segments like the newer Prime series. But in the end, it is all style, no substance. The thing I love about Metroid games the most, both in classic and Prime, is exploration and atmosphere. 
that feeling of going off the beaten path and seeing where on earth it's going to take you. Other M took almost all of that away with linear levels and long, droning cutscenes that completely ruined the pacing. The game constantly tells you in the slowest possible way what Samus is thinking at each and every point of the game. Overall, the story is really poorly written and flat out unfinished. There's also those I Spy moments where you have to click on one tiny pixel or something in the background in order to progress the story. I actually had to look some of these up online because I was stuck searching for the right pixel for too long. The only thing I do enjoy about Other M is that it controls well, especially considering that they force you to use a single Wiimote to play it. But just about every other Metroid game controls well, and they offer so much more in terms of polish, level design, enemy variety, and atmosphere. And that's my biggest beef. I'd rather play just about any other Metroid game. Number two. Hey You Pikachu. Oh boy. We've been down the Hey You Pikachu road once before on this channel, but in general, this is just another Red Steel situation. Incredibly promising tech, way before the time that that tech is actually good. This game dropped during peak Pokemania. The thought of owning your own 3D Pokemon pet that you could command with your voice just like in the show, it was just too much for a kid like me to handle. But it was also too much for the N64 to handle. It just doesn't work consistently, even when you know the exact commands that the game will accept. You're just left screaming like a lunatic in an empty space, praying that perhaps your utterings might be recognized. I might not get to live in a world where I can talk to Pikachu, but at the very least, I got to live in a world where Pikachu talked to me. Get me the hell out of here! Number one! Paper Mario Sticker Star. In Other M, they added things that we didn't want. In Sticker Star, they took away the things that we loved. Prior to Sticker Star, I felt that the first three Paper Mario games really carried the spirit of Super Mario RPG well. They take the established Mario set pieces and throw them into a new world full of new characters, witty dialogue, and RPG-styled stat building. Just like a sticker, the 3DS entry to the series peels away everything I loved about Paper Mario leaving a hollow shadow of what once was left behind. All the unique designs, creatures, and settings that brought Paper Mario to life are wiped away in favor of generic Mario characters. The classic level-up system is deleted, making regular combat feel almost completely skippable. And the combat itself is built around a system of expendable items, usually encouraging you to backtrack for the specific boss weakness item that you happen to not have in your inventory because it didn't fit. Sticker Star is one of very few games to get me to straight up stop before finishing. I just got bored. I love Paper Mario because of all the spice that they added to the world of the Mushroom Kingdom. And the only spice I got from Sticker Star was salt. The environment down here is all salt. The, the ceiling's salt, the floor's salt, the walls are salt, and to an extent, the air is salt. And you breathe that in and you can constantly taste the salt. 